Good morning. Thank you for joining us this ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Another communion Sunday is upon us, and yet here we are for the foreseeable future, still worshiping virtually. I am sure that for many of us, these words of Psalm 70 apply more than ever. You are the one who helps me and sets me free. O Lord, do not delay. But in the meantime, I invite you again to be prepared with your own cup and bread to join us later in the service. So now, even as we grow impatient, let us remember that in every circumstance and situation, our help is in the name of the one who made heaven and earth. Let us worship God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. O God, our Creator, gifts without measure flow from your goodness. Our life is your gift, and your desire for us is happiness and peace. Be close to us, hear our prayers, and guide our life's journey. Give us strength and wisdom to follow where you lead and keep us strong in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Our scripture this morning is a very familiar story from the 14th chapter of Matthew, the feeding of the 5,000. And you should know that the this happens immediately after Jesus has learned that his friend and cousin and fellow prophet, John the Baptist, had been killed. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over from the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. 
This is the word of the Lord. The feeding of the multitude, like many things in Scripture, once you begin to look closely, generates a certain amount of uncertainty. The accounts are in all the Gospels, telling of the 5,000, not counting the women and children, of course. Or did it happen twice, as both Matthew and Mark have it, once with 5,000 and once with 4,000? Once with five loaves and two fish, once with seven loaves and two fish. And were the disciples, as in today's story, the ones with only five loaves and two fish? Or was it a little boy who brought them forward, as in John's version? Or did the disciples go out and solicit the crowd, as Mark tells it? But at the end of the day, it seems to me there are some themes that hold together no matter how you tell the story. First, it was unexpected. Jesus went out to a desert place to get away. In at least some tellings of the story, he invites the disciples along. There is a CRC conference center. You may have seen it if you've ridden down Lakeshore Drive south of Grand Haven, which picks up the theme on its signboard. Come apart and rest a while. 
but the crowds followed him. The second theme that runs through all of these tellings is that they gathered in the middle of nowhere. That's what the Gospels mean by that desert place. Uninhabited, deserted. Not necessarily the Mojave or the Sahara. In fact, in today's Gospel, he goes by boat and they follow along the lake shore. Why? That's the third theme. They went out to hear Jesus preach and teach and heal. Stories like this, I think, are meant to demonstrate the charismatic hold that Jesus had upon the ordinary people of his day. There's a phrase I grew up with, never knew until I began to study where it came from, the hoi polloi. Generally, it was used in a sort of negative sense, the many, the mob, the uneducated rabble, the working class riffraff. Of course, to say the hoi polloi is sort of like saying Rio Grande River, uh, since hoi is a definite article in Greek and polloi means many, the many. These were, with a few significant exceptions, the people that Jesus walked among, the ordinary folks, the nobodies who didn't count in the grand scheme of things, the essential workers, the fishermen and day laborers, the welfare queens of his day, except there was no welfare or social security or retirement plans or medical care for ordinary folks. And they cared about Jesus because Jesus had compassion on them. In four of the six instances of Jesus feeding a multitude with loaves and fishes, that word compassion is used. And in Luke's telling, one of the instances where the word is not used, it says that when the crowd followed him, he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. In the Greek text, this compassion that Jesus had is an interesting word. It means his inner parts, heart, liver, kidneys were stirred up. Heartfelt may be a reasonable equivalent. That becomes in Latin translation the words that ultimately give us compassion in English, which literally means to suffer with. Jesus feels for them, not in the trite, I feel your pain sort of way, nor in a hypothetical or intellectual sense, but with a deep emotional stirring. He cares about them. And because he cares about them, he cares for them. And because he cares for them and cares about them, he ministers to their needs. Some of you may remember who've been around here for a while studying the book Natural Church Development. It was something that Sally Scythe had you working on during her time here as interim minister. The author of that book claims to have identified eight quality characteristics which all healthy churches, no matter the brand, share. They are all worth looking at. Things from empowering leadership, to inspiring worship, to loving relationships. But the part of the list that comes to mind in today's passage is need-oriented evangelism. Evangelism literally means bringing good news. It is not, believe Jesus my way or else, It is not doing everything in our power to enforce our beliefs upon everybody else and then crying and complaining that anybody who resists is persecuting us. We all have known a few of those folks who give evangelical and evangelicalism a bad name and have given some of us a negative reaction to that term evangelism. In fact, I saw a hashtag recently Referring to that approach, 
and I have to confess that my relish for it betrays my own lack of charity. Hashtag evil jellicles. Yes, these miracle stories are meant to demonstrate Jesus' power as a worker of wonders. But even more, I think they show us the compassionate heart of Jesus. And they call us to be like him and to do likewise. We don't all have the power to do big things, but we all have the power to do something. Need-oriented evangelism means looking at the needs of our neighbors as they identify them and doing what we can to help. And there is more power in that than we sometimes believe. People were hungry. Jesus fed them. Sometimes I think we get so focused on sophisticated theologizing that we miss the obvious. And sometimes I think we miss the real miracle. Years ago, I heard Lou Rousine, who used to be the pastor at Bethany Church down the road from us, reflecting on John's telling of the story. What if, he asked, the real miracle of multiplication was that people seeing the boy offering to share his loaves and fishes began to dig into their own stash to share with those who had none? Surely we can do the same, trusting in the multiplying power of God's love to make up the difference. Together we can change the world. Not by the great things we may wish we could do, but by the accumulation of little things that we can do. In the name of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Pray with me. Eternal Spirit, our Creator God, who brings all things into being and creates each new day for our living and breathing, we in this congregation pray for fresh reserves of mind and spirit to face the challenges of these times. We feel the weight of the great issues of a world epidemic and protests for justice and peace weighing on our shoulders even as we try to attend to the smaller, more intimate tasks of our families and friends. We pause to worship you, seeking your inspiration to care for the people in our reach. You are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and you know our needs even before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Yet look upon us here, seeking in common prayer for light upon our ways and strength within our hearts. Give us a listening ear, 
a responsive will and bring that answer to each sincere prayer that each of us needs. Eternal Spirit, out of our littleness and partialness, we seek in you a larger life. As people of old never understood this earth until they looked away from it to the sun and stars, no more can we understand ourselves until we see ourselves in our relationship to you. Release us from narrowness into a wider compassion and humility. We acknowledge our self-centeredness and that we are meanly content when things go well for us, yet we live in a time filled with troubles when hope is slackened and confidence shaken. Help us to bear witness to your good news by word and action. And give us victory over our narrowness of perspective and help us to take up our concern for every condition of humanity. All-powerful and all-knowing, all-loving God, grant us open eyes of faith to trust only you for our days. And let your everlasting righteousness lead us out of fear and into the unity of peace and of your will, realm on earth. These things we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Every week I have been emphasizing in our offertory invitation that we are called to offer our time and our talent in God's service and not just our treasure. But this week, I want again to call attention to one of the original orders, uh, one of the original places that the offertory filled in our service. And that was the bringing forth the gifts of bread and wine that make up our communion meal. The extras of which in the earliest church were taken out and distributed to the poor. So I'm going to invite you to get out your own communion bread and cup or whatever you have handy in preparation. And while we are at it, to think a little bit about how we might be able to bless those around us.
Let us pray. O God, in your goodness, you have created us in your image and challenged us to be like you, creative and loving in all that we do. As we offer to you our willingness to do that, send your Spirit upon us, set us apart for that service, and empower us in it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. My friends, as you can see, I brought forth communion elements to prepare this table, and you may wish to do the same at home. The feast we are about to share is something that we talk about in many names. Uh, sometimes communion, sometimes Eucharist, sometimes the Lord's Supper. They all point us to very various aspects of, of this, this ritual. I've set the table here uh, with bread and with grape juice in the cup, and I hope today that you who are listening in will feel free to use whatever you have at hand to symbolically share with us. Here are some of the things we will think about as we do so. This Holy Supper is a feast of remembrance of communion and of hope. In remembering, we recall anew the depth of Christ's love, who for our sake was willing to suffer and die. In the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. We are invited to commune with Christ and each other, made one in Christ's love. In hope, we believe that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when the reign of God is fully revealed. So let us give thanks together. O God, from whom we come and to whom we return, it is a good thing and good for us always and everywhere to give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. He it is who offered himself as a victim for our deliverance and taught us to make this offering in his memory. As we eat the body which he gave for us, we grow in strength. As we drink the blood he poured out for us, we are washed clean. And so joining our voices with your sons and daughters in every time and place and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Accept, O God, this offering from your whole family in memory of the day when Jesus Christ our Lord gave the mystery of his body and blood to his disciples to celebrate. Come, Holy Spirit, and bless this bread that it may be to us the communion of Christ's body and bless this cup that it may be to us the communion of Christ's blood. Grant us your peace in this life and your presence forevermore. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
My friends, this is the table of the Lord. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We invite to this table all whose conscience bids them come, all who find their way to God in Jesus Christ, who are prepared to partake of this feast in a spirit of humility, gratitude, and love, are welcome here. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. And the cup which we bless, the communion of the blood of Christ. Let us pray. O God, We give you thanks for this opportunity to come together in heart and spirit, even though separated in time and space, gathering in peace and in love to celebrate your great love for us. And even as we express that gratitude, we ask that you will continue to bless us with your presence and wisdom. Give us strength to face the trials and to take advantage of the opportunities that these days set before us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, my friends, for joining us in this service. If it has been helpful to you, please share it with others. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let us sing on our way.